Hey, good evening, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome back to FaceTime with Todd Wharton. I'm your host, as always, Todd Wharton. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Uh, spring is here. Spring is on. Spring forward. Spring the hours. Spring up. Spring into a new day. Let's have some fun, man. Let's have a good week this week. We have a great, great bunch of guests coming on this week that I'm going to tell you about at the end of the show. But let's talk about something that has definitely been bothering me. You guys notice... Um, Everybody meets a lot of these people that pretty much, you know, exaggerate the truth, so on and so on. Well, I got to tell you something, man. Those same people that exaggerate the truth and can preach about some of the things that they can do and can't do, I think those are the same people that do customer service jobs. You ever notice that when you call customer service, they tell you just as much as they want you to hear, and then the real story comes later, and then when you call them on it, they're either quiet or they come back at you crooked, right? Like it's your fault. So I think that's where customer service people come from. I think they're bred from people that just go around saying that they can do all this stuff, but at the end of the day, they can't. So um, yeah, that happened to me over the weekend. <laughs> I had three different customer service people just pretty much lie to me. And uh, yeah, and they all come in threes. Why can't good things come in threes? Why do we got the bad things? Well, even though great things come in five, because I got five days a week of just great guests, like tonight, I have a really great guest coming on tonight. I've known this man for, God knows, it's got to be about eight years now, and I'm really excited to chop it up with him tonight. He's a comedian, writer, and he's a host of his own podcast, and he's done a lot of great things in the industry. So guys, we're going to give a big, warm welcome to a legend, and I want to call him legend because he's my dude, man, Bob Lee. Bob, how you doing, brother? What's up, man? How you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm good. Welcome to FaceTime with Todd Wharton. We're in the studio. I got some new equipment, so the visual is going to be better. And uh, so we're testing everything out on you today, man. So I hope everything's going well, man. Yeah. How's everything going with you? Good. I'm using the phone, so I guess it's good. I don't know. I, I'm not good at all this. Uh, if somebody doesn't set it up for me in here, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> No, I definitely agree with you, but Instagram Live is just real cool because, first of all, we got to give it up to our virtual audience who's chiming in as we speak. Mm -hmm. It gets bigger and bigger as we go along so when people chime in. But the great thing is they get to make comments, say how you doing, and yeah. you end up getting some more followers for you, man, if they get to know you better. And that's the whole point. It's about sharing that love with each other, having a great interview, and letting people know more and more about who you are. Because some of your people don't know me. And some of my people may not know you. So tonight, they're all going to get to know us. Yeah. So welcome on, man. So, hey. Bob, I've known you for about at least eight years. And I've done a lot of research on you before. But obviously, now doing a talk show, mm -hmm. I had to do a lot more. And I learned a lot about you, man, um, that I didn't know before. I always knew you'd smoke. And, uh, you know, keep that over there. Because <laughs> I used to smoke. I, I gave it up. But... Um, so what I did not know is, which is really surprising, you're originally from Staten Island. You were born and bred out in Staten Island? I was born in Brooklyn and, you know, we moved over, you know, in about 1965, 66. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, Staten Island was all woods then. It was so much, uh, so much different than it would be now. It's like everywhere that there was woods, they just cut it down and built every spot they could. The right. Tree Streets aren't even ready to handle that many people and that, so it's so busy. So it's good to be out of there now, but I loved it there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, half of my friends are out in Staten Island now because I originally met you. Uh, we did a roast, correct? And I was the keynote speaker. Um, I think it was, uh, what's the guy who's trying to get that liposuction uh, surgery? And that's where I met you. It was me, you, Paul Veneer. Oh, yeah. Um, right? Yeah, that, that was, was like eight years uh, ago. Sat on. Paula was getting his flap. His Paula. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never been to a roast where we were raising money to help somebody get rid of his flap from the surgery that he did to lose weight. Tell me that wasn't the weirdest. <laughs> it was the weirdest fundraiser roast I've ever been to. You know, it's like, you know, if you're going to lose weight, if you're overweight, just lose weight. You know what I mean? Just go on keto or something like that. It's just, it's so easy. And uh, you can do it. You can lose it faster. 
But when you get that band or something like that, and you can only eat an egg for every day, that much in your stomach, you're going to have all this extra skin. And it's like, how is it my job to get rid of it now? I got to <laughs> <laughs> too lazy to uh, to lose weight the regular way. Oh my God, and I agree. And what they don't tell you, hopefully they tell you now, is that when they take the the fat out of you, even though it it can never go there again. Once they take it out, your body will not put fat there again. What they don't realize is that when you keep eating the way you keep eating, your mm -hmm. body will put it in other places. Yeah. So. You you kind of end up looking like a Betty Boop owl as a guy, <laughs> and it's really bad. I mean, yeah, your your forehead will get fat like places that you never thought that could get fat because you, you messed up your whole body. You're like, this isn't normal. Let's just let's just cut up something and close it so you can't really eat anything, and then we'll see what happens to you. Nothing good's gonna happen from that. I just don't get it. You know, it's like you know, if you're ugly, okay, you have to deal with that. Wear wear glasses and a hat. But, you know, you can do something without disforming yourself like this. It's, it's crazy. Correct. Yeah. And uh, it was, I mean, I was honored to be on that bill. I didn't know what I was speaking about. Like, he wanted me to come and talk about, like, yeast and all that, which is fine. But I didn't realize it was you. I think Paul Veneer, um, Uncle Nino from the Jersey Shore, uh, okay. Rain Pryor. And Rain was kind of funny because <laughs> he, mm -hmm. she sort of said, like, an arson joke. And her dad literally just like died. And she's like, wait, is that too soon? And I'm like, we were laughing because it's like, listen, you're the only one that can get away with that joke right now. If any of us said it, we would have been shot right there at the spot. So absolutely. It is what it is. So there is something I found and I was laughing because I couldn't picture it, but I haven't I've never seen you younger. Um you yeah, were cool. <laughs> What was that? Either have I. I haven't seen myself. <laughs> I don't remember. Anything. I know. I, I said a joke on a promo, which I'm like, yeah, you're so old that when you were a boy, the Dead Sea was only sick. <laughs> so it's like, hey. But I realized you were a semi-pro wrestler. Yeah. Did I read that correctly? <laughs> Yeah, I do whatever I want to do. You know, it was like I did a comedy show. Me and Jim Norton got hired to do Shane McMahon's bachelor party on a boat in off New York City. Mm -hmm. We went there. Uh, you know, it went really good, and they they liked the way I talked in that. So, uh, but you know, nothing. I went and got training in that. You know, my neighbor did it, so I was like, I'll. You know, he goes, I'll train in that. But nothing ever came of it, but I, I did it for a few years, and it was fun. I mean, there's nothing, you know, it's a lot harder than people would think. Well, I got to ask you, where did you come up with the name Heartbreaker? And, and, and it was Bobby Slayer. Bobby Slayer, the Heartbreaker. So, <laughs> because it's like Bobby Slayer, Slayer pretty much meaning the killer, mm -hmm. and then Heartbreaker mean like a love drop, so... Well, Where did the oxymoron name came come from? Yeah, it was basically a mixture of Shawn Michaels, the Heartbreak Kid, and Charlie Manson. I mean, what, what else could you be? I, <laughs> I used to have black tights with red fringe on it, and I'd wear a black vest. I looked like a broken down Shawn Michaels, so it was pretty funny. <laughs> How long were you on uh, semi pro for? Two years, maybe. You know, two three years. It was fun. You know. Now, was it at the time when you're doing it? I want to set the record straight now. We all know that mm -hmm. it's it's entertainment, right? It's stage, but it's a lot of it actually real. That's a question a lot of people want to know. Everything, all the falls and everything is real. I mean, the person that's losing is doing all the work. You know, he right. does bumps and that. If you're winning, you're just guiding. It's like it's like it's a dance. That's basically what dance and. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The person that is leading is uh, showing basically the other one what to do. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, I don't, I used to watch WWF, which is now WWE, when I was a kid. Yeah. I, had a, I had a pleasure to meet Shane McMahon mm -hmm. at a restaurant that I used to manage. And he's actually one of the nicest guys. He's a big guy. Yeah. But he was a nice guy. It's like, hey, Todd, we were drinking whiskey. We got a little buzz. 
And if I ever see him again, hopefully he'll remember the story because we had some of my Italian friends yeah. with me at the same time. And uh, he's like, God, I'm going to show you something. So if anybody messes with you, so he te he taught me how to hold somebody's wrist like this mm -hmm. behind your back. Yeah. I was in so much pain. And, and he's like, so if you ever want to do something, this is how you hold somebody down. And I'm like, this is great, man. Could you let me go? <laughs> I got to work. And I ended up walking through the restaurant for like an hour like this. I couldn't move my wrist. That's this is horrible. An arm bar. You know what I mean? You put it behind your thing and you bend it and bend the wrist, you know? If you bend it, you can't do anything. In real life, you can't do anything. Some of the no. things will hurt you. Yeah, it was, I was definitely in a lot of pain for a while and uh, I had to become a lefty for a little while. <laughs> I was just walking around like this and I, I'm not trying to make fun of handicapped people, but it got to the point where I was walking on the street <laughs> And somebody went to hand me a dollar. I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Shane McMahon hurt me. I'm good. <laughs> it was... They gave you $2. <laughs> um, listen, so besides the the, um, the wrestler, right? Mm -hmm. Comedy, and I had Stacey Prussman on the show uh, two weeks ago, who you may know. She's running for mayor. Sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Um and obviously, I'm going to have Phil Kors on soon. What, how did you really start with comedy? Because when they show clips from like Eddie Murphy and stuff, they show when he was a kid, he was just a wise ass and it was just natural for him. Mm -hmm. When did you know that comedy was a field that you wanted to aspire to get into? I, I think it when I was in bands and I was like, I don't like working with other people. I like my own schedule. I like counting on me totally. And uh, I figured, okay, what do I do now that basically isn't like work to me, you know, like waking up in the morning and, and living that life, which I, I, I don't think I could have handled it because I've worked tough jobs, you know what I mean? And it, it's not fun. And no. I just, let me get into comedy and it actually worked out right away. And I was like pretty shocked. And I was like, this is a great job. This is really fun. So what was your first paid gigs? I know for a year, obviously you have to volunteer for a lot of stuff to start building your name. So what was your official first paid gig when you did a comedy show? It was two years, exactly two years. I used two to be years. At, wow. at Orange every Wednesday, every Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever night. It was definitely Tuesday, but a lot of Wednesdays too. And uh, then I, I was headlining at, uh, it was called the Penny Arcade in Clark, New Jersey. Then it turned into Casual Times. But that was the first time I started working with an agent. And uh, it was great, you know, because all of a sudden I'm making money doing something that I can't believe I'm getting paid for, which was great. Right. Right. And back then, I mean, paid gigs were like, what, $30, $40? No, I mean the weekend. The weekend was like uh, it might have been four fifty for the weekend. Wow! Two. And then you would pick up like you'd get a a hundred and twenty five dollar Wednesday, a hundred and twenty five dollar Thursday, a seventy five dollar Sunday. So you you worked a lot, but you know you you didn't make a lot of money back then. But it was it was good back then. You know, it was no doubt about it. Yeah, I think what's different between back then and today, and I'm seeing it now, I think when, because I'm an old schooler, right? Before we had social media, it seemed there was more, um, there, there was more want to go out and go to shows, right? There was more want to sit in an audience and be a part of an audience, right? And now, and I feel bad for a lot of comedians because I had to deal with that being a, a producer of a comedy show Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people now, unless you're really famous, it's just really hard to get people to go out because their attitude is, well, I could watch it on Netflix or I could watch it on YouTube or I could do this or I could do that. And I don't want to spend the money, blah, 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 blah. And there are a lot of great comics out there, but a lot of them are never going to get the recognition that they deserve because I think social media has really been hurting a lot of the industry. Like, what do you feel about that? I just feel like if you want to enjoy something, you got to see it live. I don't care if it's a band, if you're watching a band on TV or something like that. 
It's not like being there. A comedy show, it's not like being there. A hockey mm -hmm. game, it's not like being there. And you sit at home, everybody's lazy as crap now. So basically, they'll spend, like, on the Discovery thing, the extra four ninety nine to get stupid stuff that they watch on regular TV that's even worse on TV now. That's all they're doing is repackaging garbage for people. Right. For buying it because they're lazy. But people do yeah. want to go out now. I've noticed that, you know, they've been too long. The people that are coming out are really having the time in their life. I believe music and comedy is going to come back as big as it was maybe in the, you know, for comedy in the late 80s because everybody wants to get out. Everybody wants to laugh again. Everybody wants to have fun, you know? And the people that don't want to go out, stay home, you know? I mean, you're probably not that much fun anyway if you're... If you're if you're going to hide in your house over something mm -hmm. that, you know, when the proof shows that how many people could, you know, chances are you're going to survive this 99 point something percent. So to stay, you know, you got to be careful, but the whole thing is you have to live. Otherwise, you t your, your brain shuts down. Uh, you know, you just, you, you, you just be controlled. You're controlled, you know. I, I just can never go like that. But I am careful when I go out. I don't play stupid. But mm -hmm. I'm going to go out any chance I can. Yeah, me too. And you are right about the events. I mean, you know, I'm a, I am I run one of the bigger events here in New York City, Peace. But I was telling somebody recently that events are going to be an explosion because once everything gets uplifted, but I only want things to be uplifted when at least 85% of the country is vaccinated. But even more, I was actually, you know what? I would rather have 90 because people forget 10%. Is like it could be like 20 million right so i want it to bed up with one everything but too many states right now are just like hey let's uplift everything let's party let's go out let's do this and it's like what are you guys doing it's like we didn't stay home for a year because we wanted to we're doing it because we have to yeah. you know comics don't want to not perform you know i don't want to not do my events but if I know that everybody can get me sick and I can die or I don't want to give it to somebody else. So yeah. Do I miss doing my events and going out? Of yeah. course. But honestly, if I have to stay home till the winter and do this, what I'm doing now, which I love anyway, I'd rather do that so I can get another 40, 50 years of my life to bring another 40, 50 years of great entertainment than coming out of nowhere and be like, Hey, you know, cause COVID doesn't go away because of time. COVID goes away when we create a vaccine to control it or push it away. It's, I'm just trying to figure yep. everybody out. You know? I just don't and, think uh, it goes away. It doesn't go away. It's like the flu. So, you know, a virus right. is not going to disappear. It just doesn't totally disappear, you know? So yeah. everybody's going to be, you know, people are still get it, you know? It's like, you know, you could tell when you go to the doctor, like I felt confident when I, I had my neck surgery recently, I had to take lung tests, heart tests, everything was right. perfect. So I'm not, I'm not worried. I wasn't worried. And, you know, he said, I can't believe how good you are for somebody that smokes that lived the life you did. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm just careful, but I do want to go out. I want it to open up. Uh, you know, if you're sick, if you have, you know, if you're overweight, maybe you can stay in. Maybe we can pay those people to stay in. But you have to get out and work. Without that, yeah. people are just going to people Businesses can't close down. I did a place last night, the guy, a local bar. You know what I mean? He's trying anything to make money now. He's doing comedy, right? And uh, yeah. he goes, I lost $165. That's a lot of money for a little place, you know, for not being open. Yeah. And he goes, now I get four, I'm going to have four in here but i can't make money you can't make money you can't be at the bar it's just it makes it impossible people are trying to just break even now that are able to break even but so many places are going to close because it you, you have to make money you you know either you got to pay rent or whatever you might get lucky to let you off but chances are that's not going to happen so people like yeah uh, flip I mean, what it should come down to is, is that anybody who had to be closed down, especially the restaurant industry, they shouldn't be obligated to pay rent. And the people that own those buildings 
shouldn't have to be obligated to pay rent to the bank either because the bank should turn around and be like, listen, we own this property. We don't pay anybody else. We own the property. So you know what we should do? Let's just give them a year by or a year and a half by until everything comes back because what kind of bank am I going to be or an investor if I'm charging my clients money they can't afford knowing that it's not their fault that they're out of business. It's because of a worldwide pandemic. And that's what I'm trying to yeah. figure out. Like, there's no love anymore between. It's like, that's the way we're going to get out of it because I don't want to see businesses closed. But at the no. same time, you can't charge people rent if you knowing well, it's they're not losing business because they're just not marketing properly. They're losing business because the government said you need to shut down. So we yeah. can talk about that all they day. Should, yeah, they yeah, should just I mean, basically say, Give you two years, you don't have to pay. If we open early, then hey, make some money, you know? Right? I mean, it's simple. And then we can all be in this together. But how are we all in this together if we're constantly being spread apart and it doesn't make sense? Um, yeah. I also wanted to talk about your name because uh, I actually never asked you that. Now, when people hear the meaning reverend, they obviously think of yeah. religion, right? Um, mm -hmm. I always thought like you're like the religious meaning in a comedy where maybe you threw religion in there or whatever, but I know you got your name, I believe, from a friend, but where did that name come from? And what is pretty much the meaning behind it? Well, it was it was during the open mics at Rascals. Jackie the Joke Man, Martin was the, uh, he would host it, you know what I mean? And we heard it on the Stern show, that, and that's how I go, hey, we can do this, you know? <laughs> I'll go down there. And I think it was like, it might have even been the second show I ever did. The first show went really good. The second one, I'm just, I'm totally offending people. I, I'm not getting any laughs. They hate me. They despise me. I don't know. I'm not good enough to be able to get out of that or change or do anything. Right. So I just kept going until my time was done. It's so awkward when I say goodnight and Jackie came up and he goes, hey, how about a hand for the reverend? You know, And that's how it happened. Because he didn't know what to say. It was just so offensive, so horrible. And he just had to say something to lighten the, the, the mood a little bit. And that's what he said. And that it just worked. Yeah. Sometimes uh, out of nowhere, the best names just come out of the spotlight. And when you run mm -hmm. with it, you become that name overnight. It happens with a lot of people. And I believe that. Like, I believe uh, Mean Joe Green. Somebody yeah. called him out one day. And it just clicked and it just stuck with them forever which is pretty cool now we, we'll talk about a couple of the things from your past because it is part of your history but i definitely yeah. want to get into what you're doing today obviously um mm -hmm. so you were briefly with you know in the past with the howard stern show which you know it, it was a great show a milestone but what exactly were you doing with that show i know you were sending in a lot of like uh parodies and stuff to the show but what part were you taking place with uh, Mr. Stern during that show? Well, I started that. I started that in I think 2002. I think I went to 2010. Um, basically, it started. They heard about the blue cheese bit. I called in. Right. Then they had the meanest contest, and you roasted somebody. So I would make tapes and send in, you know. And then I started sending a, a bunch in. And uh, then I had the contest, and I ended up winning the contest. And uh, wow. then I was a regular on the show. I would sit in, you know, every two to three months, three, about three months back then, three to, three to four months you would get in for sure. And then you would make phone calls and that. And uh, then I started sending in ideas, just bits or whatever. I was listening in the morning and just do whatever. And then... Uh, when we went to Sirius, I ended up uh, getting, uh, well, first the, the roast thing came. Uh, we were going to do the roast. Uh, I was going to do the roast show separate on Howard 101. And then like right. four days before it, I got word that Howard wanted to go live with it on the show. And that's crazy, you know. And we did it live and it, it, it clicked good, you know. Then it kind of blew up. Then we had an explosion. Then, you know then it went good again, you know, but it was amazing. And I ended up getting my own show on Howard 101, Miserable Men, which we're coming back with now with Shuley, Mark Burns, and uh, Mike Morse. So that'll be mm -hmm. hitting the air soon, you know, all over the air. That. 
but it's fun, you know. It was a great time. It was like it's it's so creative to be on the, on the greatest show, <laughs> you know, yeah. in radio. Yeah, he was the number one radio show of all time, if I don't if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I would say I would say it was the biggest, definitely, you know, and uh, it was yeah. amazing to be. You didn't realize how many people you hit when you were on regular radio. Oh my God, it was like you go, you go. It everything changes, you know. It like you still have your your regulars that came and seen you all the time before I was on there, but then all of a sudden, now it's an explosion of these people that want to hear you because they hear you on the radio, and it, it's mm -hmm. a it was the thing it was bigger than any going on a late night show or anything like that it was the greatest thing you can go on and all the big stars went on there to promote their stuff you know and it was just uh it was a place to be and it was definitely the place to to do comedy to be a comedian on that show was amazing yeah yeah you never know where your career is going to take you and your career was steadily going this way you know, and then once you get to that point, sometimes it just takes off because from there, yeah. you're already talented, you're already making your own name, but from there, and you know, doesn't matter how you left it, this and that, you met a lot of great people. And then eventually, yeah. I know you and Artie Lang became good friends and Artie was no stranger to Saturday Night Live. Like he is one of the legends from SNL. And uh, tell me about that relationship that you have with Artie, because it just seems like that was a long thing that you guys had going for a while. Well, yeah, we used to, we just got along right from the beginning, and we started working together. And then I, I was able to say, you know, you can get so much more money doing this. And he goes, oh, I don't know what I'm worth. And I was like, watch, I'll show you. And I would show him with the numbers and how many people came. And his money would just keep going up and up and up and up, and it was unbelievable. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was the height of uh, Stern. You know, it was like 2003. We might have. It wasn't long after I'd been on the show. We started going on the road, and it started with him making fifteen thousand a weekend with me, and then it just went explosive. But it was like it was amazing time, and I just hope he's doing well now. You know. Uh, He's been through hell, you know. I've been through hell, but I kind of got my shit together. I'm hoping he got his shit together now, and uh, everything's going to turn out well, because you know, it it it's a, it's a crazy business. It's a you know when you have to deal with everything going this or that way, you can be on top of the world. Next day, you feel like, oh my god, everyone's coming down on me. You know, sometimes people go to drinking, drugs, whatever. Uh, yeah. they just forget about it sometimes. It's just a crazy business. It's and everything's out there for you, so it, it's hard. Yeah, and uh, a lot of times, especially on this show, I really never bring up skeletons with people or anything because mm -hmm. my attitude is it, it's in the past, right? You know, if you reconcile and you did yourself better, which is great. And I don't know if you caught the show with Todd Bridges from Different Strokes. I did Todd last week, mm -hmm. and pause, no pun intended, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, Todd out of nowhere, because I was not going to bring up anything, because it happened a long time ago, and I don't care. Todd's a great guy. And he out of nowhere, he's like, hey, Todd, I just wanted to let you know that I'm 18 years sober. And I'm just like, yo, man, congratulations, because we it's wow. uncomfortable. You know, I'm sick and tired of seeing talk shows where people just blast people with negative comments because they want the drama. And it's like, listen, then go watch mm -hmm. MTV, right? Go watch VH1. I don't want to hear the drop. I want to hear everything great that you're doing right now. You know, we're going to get into your new show in a little bit. But one of the things I love about you is you're such an amazing pop, right? From what I see, I don't know about your home life, but you actually have a yeah. really cool son, right? Dominic. And Dominic yeah. performed on our show that we were trying to do at the Broadway Comedy Club. And they were awesome. And now he's part of a new band. So tell me the inspiration yeah. that your son has with you in turn that you have with him because you guys kind of have a cool deal going on. Yeah, I mean, the first time, like, okay, he wanted to get into entertainment and he was doing comedy when he was like 14. He was, and he was making just tips. He would do like five, 10 minutes and he'd make $100 yeah. a night. And then all of a sudden I took him to see Paul McCartney in Washington 
And on the way home, he's oh, like, wow. you still got I'm like, yeah, I still got the bass. And from there on, he, he learned every instrument. He could play every instrument right now. He even bought a banjo now. He plays the drums, keyboards, guitar, bass. He sings. Uh, the band that they're in now, Fat Mez, they're all over, like, Facebook. And uh, they're just blowing up. And then him and Billy Thoden are doing, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Ronnie, uh, not Ronnie. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Stevie, Va Stevie Ray uh, Stevie Ray. Uh, Vaughn? Bond. Stevie Ray Vaughn. Stevie Ray Vaughn. Yeah, he's one of my favorite blues players. Yeah, they're doing a uh, tribute act to him. They're starting off in Delaware in, in about a week or two. And they're just amazing. They're amazing. And uh, it, it's Billy's going to be in Dallas in a month or two with Tom. They're going to do... Uh, Billy got voted... Uh, in the top 10 guitar players under 20 in the country. And that was wow. supposed to go last year, yeah, but COVID came. So they allowed him this year, you know, everyone that was that age uh, last year. So they're going out there. And I do believe, I do believe he's going to win. I do believe he's going to win because I've never seen anything like that. Uh, so young. I, I seen him when he was oh, 14. Yeah. I, I, as long as he has a good household supporting him, he should go far, and he's got to believe in himself. But I'm actually in awe that we have kids of that age that even know who Stevie Ray Vaughan is, and on top, they're doing a tribute yeah. band to him, a performance, which is crazy because every time I talk to somebody, if I don't mention somebody from the past 10 years and it's earlier than that, they're like, who? Wait, who's yeah. that? I'm like, are you serious? Like, I've, I've spoken to people that don't even know who Bob Molly is. And Bob Molly to me, is, like, right up there with God, you know, like a Paul McCartney or the Beatles, you know. And when I hear that, I'm just like, yo, guys, you really need to learn your history on where all this stuff came from. Because a lot of yeah. the music that you hear today, even the comedy, a lot of comedies, comics, take other people's work and they make their own spin on it. And they do the <clears> same thing in music. So it's uh, it's a little crazy now. Getting um back to your comedy. Speaking of that, are you still uh, doing stand up right now? Um, are you doing any shows as, as we speak, or are they multi virtual? Uh, no, I haven't done. I won't do something. I mean, I'm not gonna. You know, I I had I did two shows in front of cars, and that was ridiculous. So I was like, let me just write, uh, get a podcast. But yeah, I'm. Uh, this week, uh, uh, Wednesday till Friday, I'll be at Uncle Benny's in Point Pleasant, you know. I'll be there Wednesday night with Joey Diaz, who's great. And uh, then I'll be there by myself Thursday, Friday. And, uh, you know, Saturday I'm at uh, Tips Comedy Club in Morris Plains. You know, so it's starting to come back. And, you know, you can't have the same numbers in there, but people are excited, you know. And, and we're mm -hmm. excited, too. It's... Uh, it, it's like being yeah, reborn yeah. again after. I hope so. I hope so. And I have to agree with you about so many shows with cars and virtual. I understand why people want to create something like this, you know, to give more. But be, I always tell people, before you think about creating something, think about the outcome of it, right? Just think mm -hmm. about it. Just because you want to do it doesn't mean it's a really good move. Like the perform in front of cars, me personally, I think it's kind of lame because when you're a comedian, and I'm on stage all the time, you know that, the audience, yeah. the way they react, plays a major role in your speech, in your comic routines, the whole nine. And when people are honking the horns, it's like, that's kind of weird, and it's annoying at the same time. Like, eh, what if somebody has an old school horn? Like, eh, uh, you know, it's just like, you don't know. And then virtual, you're performing, but you can't hear anybody laughing or booing or anything. And it's like, you might as well just perform for yourself. You know, or they wave hands and it's like, listen, I get you're trying to guys are doing something different. But some things just mm -hmm. don't work. It just doesn't make sense. Like, do you understand? Do you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's like there should be things up front that say, this is not real comedy. This is not what you would see when you come to a club. Please do not think this is real comedy. And then you can do what you want. I'm not going to do it. I, I just find it, you know, it's like there's nothing like being in front of a live audience. So I was like, I'll wait it out. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, 
I'll enjoy other stuff, you know, than, you know, just, you know, you, you're, you're whoring yourself out. It, it be, you become a whore, you know, it's like, it's like, look at me, look at me. I, 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 you know, I'm in a big parking lot. Oh my God, you see all the spaces that were there. Yeah. What are you going to brag about? You know, how somebody's battery died from honking the horn all night and leaving their lights exactly. on for you. <laughs> Nothing impressive. Nobody's getting late after a goddamn car show. <laughs> that's true and it's like comedians hate the awkward silence and how can you perform with total silence throughout your whole routine and how can you really get a punchline in there when there's no reaction that's what I don't understand like like Bob you're a funny guy but if you do a whole show with me right now I'm pretty much will probably feel like this trying mm -hmm. to laugh because there's nobody else around to co-sign my chuckle you know and I just feel like an idiot so that's why I'm telling people, just but you know, now you, I understand you're hungry, but wait it out. No, yeah. well, the whole thing bad. is what has to be directed, I'll be guided. And sometimes the people in the audience guide themselves to enjoy the show more. Because, yeah, mm -hmm. if, if there's, if, like I always said, if you can kill in front of a small group, you, it's so easy in front of a big crowd. Mm -hmm. It's just so much easier. Some comedians, if they see oh, a yeah. small crowd, they're like, oh, I'm just going to do time. There's no such thing. Do your time. No, you do your time and you try to kill because these people, hey, no matter what, you know, it's like, but, but comedians are idiots, you know? Oh, yeah. 100% agree with you. 100% agree. Um, speaking of uh, comedy now, which we've been talking about, you restarted a new show called Levy Land. So why don't you talk to me about mm -hmm. that? How did you get started with that? Because I know your co-hosts are Rob Stahl and Chris Abels, I believe, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, How did that, you guys that get started just, with that uh, concept? I, I would just, uh, you know, this is always like kind of a idea of the show I have always done. You know, it's like I always I have a thing that I know how to build the show. You have the beginning, you know, this part, the next part, and the end. And then you just fill in the rest. And a lot of And I, I try to answer that are, that are funny and just know more about them. Or whatever. I want to know about them, you know growing up and all that stuff. And uh, it's just been a lot of fun. So we're like, you know, we're at maybe episode nine coming out on Friday. We have Chrissy Mayer coming on. And it was a great interview, you know? And it, her interview was great. The, the beginning of the show, it's about us. It's not about, you know, we do do other story like a fake news story, but it's basically about our lives. And once you suck them into that to understand what you know that your life is just the same as everyone else's everybody's like oh yeah that happens to me i get it i understand they're not trying mm -hmm. to bullshit us you know they're not trying to make believe something happen this shit happens and it's funny i don't care everybody's life is funny annoying and this and that yeah 100 percent. and you know what i'm finding i was speaking about this with somebody else i'm i'm kind of worried about comedy right now and there's a reason why i'm saying that it seems that everybody mm -hmm. is just so damn sensitive now on every, every issue, you know? And the whole point of comedy is to laugh about life, right? It, it's a relaxation of the realism. I think comedians and talk show hosts like Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, I think the reason why they're so important is just so much negativity in the world when it comes to politics and issues comedy takes a real issue and puts a com and comedic view on it, right? Even though it's yeah. real, it's a comedic view. And I'm worried about guys like Chris Rock and these others that are amazing comedians because their whole shows is based on realism and controversy the whole nine. But it seems like everybody's sensitive today. Like, did you see what just happened with uh, Pepe Le Pew in uh, yeah. uh, Space Jam? Like, it, you see what I'm saying? And everybody knows I love all communities. Like, I have a lot of friends in the gay community, African-American, Latino. Everybody knows me. I run a peace concert. But yeah. there's a sensitivity issue, right? I'm Italian, right? 
I get the Italian jokes told me all the time. And I laugh my ass off because they're funny and they're true to a point, but they're funny. Yeah. Why am I going to take it personally? But people, I think, are just trying to find reasons to be miserable. And it's like, dude, we're not personally going at you. It's just, it's jokes. That's all it is. It's funny. It's like when you're at the table it, with it's the, the family. People that, the people that can't do. Yeah, but it's the people that can't do yell. They complain. They can't. They, you know, they start their day miserable. They, they know that everywhere they go, they have a story. They go shopping. They're gonna have a story why it's taken so long to to wait in line. They, they want people to see them upset. They go home and they'll talk about it. You know, that's their life. You, you know, it's like, okay, are we really? It's these are not people that are coming to the shows live. I get, I know that for sure. I, I, I don't change a damn. I go the way I want to go. I go as right. far as I want to go. Every, there's no problem out there. It's the people that are just too stupid to understand that this is not happening in real life. I did. I was in a club last night. It was, it was, it was. Black, it was Spanish, and it was white, okay? And I said, and Chinese, too. And I said, does anybody have a fucking problem with anybody? And I'm, I'm like, you know, neither am I. You know, it, you don't see it. I go, do you see it out there? And they're like, no, we, we don't. Because it's not there. It's what you're told it's there. It's not happening the way that they make it sound. Everybody would get along if, if there was no news, okay, when they start doing the things, oh, people are attacking Asians, right? It's all over the news. What is this sick thing? Yeah, and thing? you see me on that, too. I've been at the yeah. Christian Hall thing. I'm one of the civil rights guys fighting for that. Yeah, but the whole thing is, is that when somebody that's a maniac hears this, it programs them to go do it. It's not right. normal people. Nobody has a problem with anybody. But if you keep putting it out there, oh, oh, I can be on the news if I do something like this, you know, you put a camera up, you're always going to find an idiot behind the, the guy talking. You know what I mean? Just right. making noises or yelling. Because it attracts idiots. It's like a light that attracts flies, you know? It's, and moths. It's just the way it is. So you put a camera, you put the news out, boom. Idiot people just come right to the light. And they're like, oh, my God, everybody's racist. Why are they making jokes? Why are they making jokes? Because everybody... We, everybody does this. Last night we had a ball busting each other's balls and we were all different. It doesn't, you know, yeah. nobody's out to hurt anybody. I made good friends. I got their numbers and that stuff. You know, I don't know who yeah. they are. I met them last night, but we had a great time together. Yeah, and I love that you're saying that because um, comedy to me is like a salvation. It's like a relief from reality, right? It's when you're so tightened up, I love going, I love seeing comedians, great comedians, um, because it, it just makes you relax, right? It makes you laugh, and we all need to laugh more. Like, listen, nobody wants Asian hate, black hate, white, nobody wants that. And the ones that do, I, I just don't understand the mentality, but comedy is such a great thing to have. I, I love watching SNL. I, want, I love watching these guys just make parodies of political things. And, I mean, presidents alone give comedians four years worth of comedy, right? So, um, and we're not making fun up. of... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know who. They have nothing. They have nothing. Kimmel stinks. Let's get to the facts. Kimmel stinks. All those late night hosts are almost doing what somebody's telling them to do. Please right. do this. I don't, you're not funny. I'm still going to, what's wrong with being funny? SNL stinks, okay? It stinks. It, 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 it's, it's, it's something that, you know, if I'm going to torture somebody, I'm not going to do it with a flamethrower. I'm going to put that show on, right. okay? And I'm going to put it on for 24 hours a day with the lights on. They keep the lights on, and they're, they're, I'm going to tie their head so they have to watch it the whole time. It is so unfunny. You know what I mean? It is so unfunny. When you have uh, 45 writers, and I can write it myself better than that, you know, in, in, in three days, it's the worst thing that you can ever put on TV. You know what I mean? You might, I'd rather yeah. just, I'd rather 
out with my mother and push her down the stairs, I would laugh more. I would laugh more. <laughs> oh, man, I can't believe <laughs> I, I'm not going to argue with you because... What was that? Entertainment like that, Tonight Show, anything like that, it'll never come back unless you put someone in there that's a little edgy and funny and makes fun of just normal things in life or everything in life, everything in life. You get what I'm saying? Not, not just one yeah. site. It's okay to make fun of everybody. That's cool. But stop being like that, you know? It's like, it, it's like you're not, you just recreate every show, you know? It, it's just not funny. Come up with an idea. You know, you don't have to call it the new Golden Girls because to call it, you know, four old bags living together again. Something like that. <laughs> Change the name. What, what are the Sopranos going to come out with an all Spanish cast? You know what I mean? It doesn't. Yeah, it's something. Be name it something else. At least try to. It'll be called the Tenors. Ten years from now, it'll like... be called the Altos. <laughs> No, I hundred percent agree with you. Like, I'll be I'll be honest with you. This show right now, based on all the original stuff that I've been doing on this for years, I'm starting to put it all together. I have people watching this show. Um, when I redo it and I send it out, there are networks right now that are interested in this show, um, because it's it's about interviewing a listers from the past, the a listers from today putting them on one show with all original skit, all original everything. And I'll be honest with you, my little brother's one of my comedy sketch writers, and I write, and damn, I would love to turn around one day and be like, hey, Bob, I'm the executive producer of this show. Would you like to write some comedy sketches and make it original? Because I don't want anything new. I just don't. No. I want it all original based on everything because – that's what people are going to. And the people are watching that, you guys should watch some of my promos. Like I created a family called the Wookiees. You know, it's like an old school 1950s yeah. family, but they're like, you know. And even with your thing today, I did a parody where I pulled the Will Farrell thing and it was just me and him going back and forth dissing on each other. So it's yeah. about originality and stuff and it's really funny. And that's why I like your show. Like, I know you interview a lot of great comedians, but besides the comics, are there particular topics that you strictly stick to on your show or are you guys just like all over the place it's all over the place it's whatever it's like i get there and i'll have like a paper with a few ideas like a skeleton like i always have and then something will happen i go all right let's start the show boom we uh, just follow me that's what i say just follow me i i i i, I when you would have people that can follow you i you know i haven't had people been able to follow me and understand what I was saying since Joe Conti and John Kensel. And we're probably going to mm -hmm. do a show again, too. But, and then Pat wow. Dixon, guy who's amazing, who is a mind that I never met anybody like him. Me and him working together, we can just start talking. And it becomes a, an hour bit of, uh, because of the way that we do it. And when, you'll see when we start doing something, what that's going to be about. But it's like, it, it's like you, when you have people that you can just be funny with, you know, just things will come, things will come. Mm -hmm. And you always have the stuff to fall back on. 100% agree with you on that 100%. Speaking of following, so guys, if you don't know, I've been uh, talking with the Reverend Bob Levy, you can follow him on Instagram. It's Levy Bob, very simple, L-E-V-Y-B-O-B. -E -B. Uh, you can get his information there. By the way, Bob, I wanted to ask you, your website, is it down right now? Are you guys redoing it? Because when I went to it, I noticed that. I don't know if you took it no. off or not. Well, I didn't. I, once the accident, the car accident happened, I was like, I came up for renewal, and I was in really bad. You know, I was pretty bad. And I was like, if I get this website back, I'm not going to get better. You know? So I let it go. And I think a yeah. bank has it. still kind of put something up about me. Uh, but now it's just on syndicateradio.tv. We're going to add a comedy section there, but you got the links to the show. But yeah, I mean, it was like I was just going through hell, and I really never thought I'd get back into business again. Yeah, I mean, when I spoke to you, I remember you telling me after the accident that you were pretty much done. You're like, yeah, I, I would love to, but I'm done with this. And when I saw you come back, I'm like, yes. I'm like, this is awesome because 
you could do a lot of this stuff from your home now. You don't have to go anywhere. You know, and it keeps you busy, yeah, which is great. Yeah, I mean, I like to go out and do it live. Like I said, I got the neck surgery in November. I basically felt better, you know, like a lot better in a week. I felt like 60, 70 percent better. And I'm still like above that, maybe 70, 75. But to feel that much better than I was, I said to my wife, I said, look, I either retire or I go in this big time. I mean, I'm talking about balls deep. And I go, I really think I have something now. My mind is more open. I went to rehab to get off Xanax uh, before this, you know, two years ago. And just everything. I go, I'm on again. I know I can do something huge. And she goes, go, go, go for it. And I was like, uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, which is awesome. I'm glad you're back, man. How long have you been in the industry total? Like, you've had a long career. Well, uh, I would say 32 years, something like that, man. 34, you can't beat that, you know. I, I've never had a job longer than six months going into this, so i got to be pretty happy about it. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a, a, a great goal. I mean, your father probably looking down at you like, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, what's going yeah. on with this guy? <laughs> comedy when my when my dad would go this is my son one day he said this is my son he's a comedian and I was like wow okay I, I made it now I know I'm good you know <laughs> that's crazy man well we have a few minutes left so um let's repeat it again so we know people can follow you on Instagram on Levy Bob okay where can they listen to your show what time the shows on and where if they can call in just uh, you know, say something as you know, as a caller. Where can they find all this again? Well, they can go to syndicateradio.tv, and you'll see the YouTube pages up there. We have eight shows up now. Just follow us on YouTube. Put the flag up, and then when the new show comes out Fridays at noon, you'll know it's going. Uh, basically, it looks like it's going live at that time for an hour or whatever we do, yeah. and. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Levy underscore Sir, because I got I got thrown off of there, you know. So, but you know, my my Instagram it was Bob Levy, but I lost the password, so I just went Levy Bob. But you know, the, the, that's it. Yeah. So I got nine shows up. Uh, Lord Baltimore. Well, you can always right change thing. it back if you want to. Yeah. Well, we're glad to hear that you're back, Bob. I'm glad you're doing really well. Um, I'm glad you're healthy. Okay. Because uh, you know. We, we need you for another at least 50 years. <laughs> we definitely need comedy in our life. And I appreciate it. Yeah, at least, at least, listen, I'm giving you a phone right now. Take it. <laughs> God's tapped me on the okay. show. He's like, tell Bob we got another 50. 15, I'll take. Oh, I'm easy. All right, all right, 15, 15. Well, listen, I appreciate you for being on FaceTime with Todd Wharton. Uh, if you guys don't know, you can follow this show at my Instagram, Todd Wharton Official, W-H-A-R-T-O-N. We interview celebrities five days a week, every week, straight ahead. Uh, just give you guys an update on what we have coming up. Uh, just like Bob Levy, a great guest. Uh, this week, we have the legendary R&B group, Soul For Real. It's going to be in the house tomorrow night. Uh, Wednesday night, we got A-list actor Malik Whitfield is going to be in the house tomorrow night. I mean, uh, Wednesday night. We have the legendary hip-hop artist, uh, Mr. Cheeks from The Lost Boys, is going to be here on Thursday. And my girl, and I'm excited to first interview her, Miss Angie Stone, is going to be in the house on Friday. So we have a great lineup this week. And all the way through April, we're pretty much booked with all different celebrities of all industries. And Bob, thank you again for being on FaceTime with Todd Wharton. Uh, always a pleasure to have you back. And... Um, let you know when we're done this interview will be shown on my instagram within five minutes so you'll be able to share the interview the whole night all right all right so thank you're gonna you have to again i appreciate that. you man all right and thank to everybody else out there thank you for my virtual audience for listening to facetime with todd wharton and like i always say to everybody please wear your mask practice social distancing and if you're not living a passionate life then whose life do you live in? guys have a great night i'll see you tomorrow night